So I was very happy to hear that. And I'm really, really, really hoping that in a six months or so, I'm going to get emails from some of you oh. <laughs> telling me the same thing. Yeah, yeah. We hope so. So uh, before I start, uh, let me give Ingrid a chance to introduce herself. Okay, please, Bu Ingrid. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, well, I was even more happy for <laughs> uh, having Professor Jacobs uh, accepted my invitation to the research. It's really important and meaningful to me. Um, I'm Ingrid Gavilan Tatin. I'm from Chile and I'm mm. studying in Indonesia, uh, in Yogyakarta, precisely in Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta. Mm. And I'm also following uh, linguistics, so apply linguistics. So that's how I kind of online met um, Professor Jacobs during one of his talks about ecolinguistics. And yeah, that's how my journey started, actually. So yeah, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank so, you. Hope you. You enjoy this. Absolutely. You're doing a master program or PhD program at uh... master degree. Yeah, master degree. Okay. And later, later this evening, Ingrid will tell us a little bit about this the study that she is doing. Okay. Yeah. Good. So I want to say that uh, during this presentation, anytime you have a question, mm. you uh, maybe something I say isn't clear or you want to learn more, or you want to disagree. I love questions. I love disagreements. So uh, for of Jacob, uh, some, some students are, are from Indonesian uh, department. Uh, oh, okay. I'm recording. I'm recording this uh, lecture. So uh, next week I'll discuss uh, the summary yeah, with them again. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry that I cannot do the lecture in <laughs> Austin, Indonesia. Indonesia. So please accept my apologies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I believe that Prof. Safnil has already given you a copy of the PowerPoint. Yes. Yes. I, I, I the what you're going to see now is the same one, but I made it more beautiful. Before it was very plain. Now it's got colors, okay? But the content is the same. And here's how you can contact me. Like I said, I hope that I will be hearing from some of you in the future, either uh, tomorrow or six months from now. So there's my email address. Right now, I teach at James Cook University which is an Australian university located in Singapore. So I've been in Singapore for a long, long time. So here's, um, here's a definition of ecolinguistics. Okay, that ecolinguistics can be defined as an exploration of the role of language in the life-sustaining interactions of humans, other species, and the physical environment. Okay, so in other words, we humans have to interact with other species, other animals, with plants, and the physical environment. And this definition comes from the website of the International Ecolinguistics Association. And there's the URL. I'm a member of the association. You can join also, it's free. And they also have a free course. So you see the second URL there. You can take this course. It's a free online course. It's asynchronous. So you can study whenever you have time. And it's based on a book called Stories We Live By, written by Professor Aaron Stibbe, who is the convener of the International Ecolinguistics Association. I've taken the course, I recommend it.
Now, one question I get is, what's the difference between ecolinguistics and critical discourse analysis, CDA? Well, mostly they're the same, except that ecolinguistics focuses mostly, but not exclusively, on how we humans interact with non-human earthlings. In other words, other beings who live on earth and with nature. And I just want to emphasize that critical doesn't mean only negative. It means critiquing, it means analyzing, it means oh, understanding. As a matter of fact, there's even a kind of discourse analysis called positive discourse analysis. And that highlights discourses that promote empowerment and social change. So I really want to emphasize the positive. To give you a bit of background in ecolinguistics, probably the most famous person whose ideas helped to found ecolinguistics was Michael Halliday. I'm sure that you've all heard of him. So he gave a plenary address at the 10th ILA. ILA stands for International Association for Applied Linguistics. And by the way, next year, the ILA Congress is going to be in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And it's a hybrid conference. You can attend online as well as in person. So if you can't make it to Kuala Lumpur, you can still attend online. And what Professor Halliday said is language does not passively reflect reality. Language actively creates reality. So the language we use creates the reality that we live in. And Professor Halliday went on to say, our reality is not something ready-made and waiting to be meant. It has to be actively construed and language evolved in the process of and as the agency of its construal. So agency means we have power. So we can do something. We can change language and we can change the effects that language has on ourselves and on the rest of the world. In terms of philosophy, I think there's two opposing views about the relationship between us humans and the rest of the beings that live on Earth. And one view is called anthrocentrism. Anthro meaning humans. Anthrocentrism says humans are superior to all the other beings on the earth, the other animals, the other the plants, etc. Humans have greater worth. And because we're superior, we have the right to dominate all the other living things on the planet. So the other species of plants, animals should give way to humans. In other words, if we want to cut down a forest to get some trees or to grow some, to get some, to get some, uh, to get some land to grow plants to feed to the animals who we eat, well, that's our right. We can do whatever we want. And whether or not a species is worthwhile, is valuable, is measured by that species' usefulness to us humans. And usually when we talk about nature, when we talk about the world, we tell stories from humans' perspective, not from the perspective of other beings. Now, the opposite view is called ecocentrism. So eco, that means the environment, the ecosystems of the world. And according to ecocentrism, all species have intrinsic worth. In other, in other words, just by themselves, they are worthy of living, of being able to live. They don't, their worth is not measured 
by how much they can help humans. So economic growth should not be as important as protecting species. Many governments talk about GDP, gross domestic product, how big the economy is. But that's important. But protecting species, protecting the environment is also important. And so ecocentrism says some areas of Earth should be protected from human use. Like I've read that some parts of Sumatra, they're like a reserve where human activity is very limited. Also, when we tell stories about the world, we should take into account the perspectives of other animals, not just humans' point of view. As a matter of fact, you probably heard about the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. And so ecolinguistics definitely fits with the SDGs. If you look at them, so many of them are affected by the environment. For example, number two, zero hunger. And you know that hundreds of millions of people on planet Earth don't have enough to eat and millions die every year. And even more children have their growth stunted. Their bodies and their brains don't develop fully because of a lack of food. But actually, we produce more than enough food for everyone. What happens to the food that could feed these hungry people? It gets fed to the cows and the chickens who later we humans eat. So that's a very inefficient system. And almost all of the SDGs are linked to the environment. And of course, SDG has two key words, sustainable and development. So ecolinguistics is not saying don't build factories, don't have electricity. So that's the development and that's needed. But we also want to do it in a sustainable way. So we want to create a comfortable life for everyone and the same at the same time that we protect the environment for future generations. Another key concept with the uh, SDGs and with ecolinguistics is called intersectionality. Intersectionality is talking about the overlap, the overlap between sustainable development goals and environmental issues. So for example, SDG six is clean water and sanitation because billions of people lack access to clean water, lack access to sanitation, and that causes many diseases, many deaths. As a matter of fact, I helped a little bit with a project in, uh, in Bintan, you know, which you know is in the Riau Islands, because some families there don't have sanitation. They don't have clean water. So people from various schools in Singapore and Malaysia went there and helped to build sanitation systems with clean water. Okay, so obviously, if people have clean water, if they have sanitation, that's going to help their health. So SDG 6 and SDG 3 are linked together. Before I go on, let me stop and see any questions, anything I can clarify. Again, I apologize for not being able to. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bahasa Indonesia. Okay. So, Ada yang ingin bertanya? Yeah. You can ask question in Bahasa Indonesia. Boleh bertanya dalam Bahasa Indonesia? 
So let me start first, uh, Prof. Jacob. Please. It seems to me that ecolinguistic is not only about language. It's about right. human, human life and uh, our environment. Absolutely. So, you're, uh, Prof. Safno, you are 110% correct because it's like the definition that I gave, I think the second or third slide, it's the interaction between the language we use and what goes on with the ecosystems and the living beings on the planet Earth. Because as everyone knows, the environment is in bad shape and getting worse. So therefore, as intellectuals, as scholars, as academics, we have a role. Our job is not just to write articles where we try to understand the world, where we analyze. That's very important. But we also have the job of trying to change things for the better. Okay. Silakan, ada yang bertanya yang lain? Is there any other questions? Yeah, from the students. Silakan. I have a question. Okay, oh. from May Hardia. Yeah, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, Prof. Jacobs, it's quite interesting uh, studying about eco-linguistic. Can you give us the real sample of what is it, analyzing eco-linguistics, uh, which is support the sustainable development goals? I still cannot uh, what is it, imagine how can the eco-linguistics support the sustainable development goals that seven things that you mentioned before. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question, Maya Hardia. That's, that's my favorite question <laughs> because it's that, that's, what, that's what I'm working on. And I've done a number of projects and I'm doing one with uh, Ingrid, mm -hmm. who you've met already, and she's going to be talking about that. Uh, and Later in this PowerPoint, I'm going to be giving more examples. And at the end of the PowerPoint are two slides with references. Mm -hmm. And some of those references are articles that I helped to write that do that are about ecolinguistics and how we can use ecolinguistics. Okay. So uh at the end of the presentation, please tell me if you want more examples. And maybe you and I can work on some. <laughs> we develop some of our own that are that are relevant to to Sumatra, South Sumatra. Yeah, I I have read some article about ecolinguistic and I interested that ecolinguistic related to the culture. For example, the metaphor ones, uh, uh, the what is it? The proverb in certain community, we can also analyze that from the eco linguistic. Is that right? That's yes. For example, remember I mentioned earlier about positive discourse analysis. Mm -hmm. and what some people are trying to do is they're trying to analyze stories from different cultures. Mm -hmm. that are eco-friendly. Because remember, I talked about anthropocentrism. That means humans are superior. Humans control everything. But also there's ecocentrism, where humans are just part of the whole environment. And we, we have to fit in. We have to treat the rest, the other members of the environment in a nice way so that we can all coexist. So yeah, um, for example, I know someone who teaches at University, University Malaya in Kuala Lumpur. He teaches Tamil language. You know, Tamil is a language in Southern India. And so he was telling me a lot of stories from Tamil culture, from traditional Tamil culture. 
where people really respect the trees. Mm -hmm. And so they really try to take care of the trees. And they, they're against cutting down trees. And many other examples. I've if you go to the to the website of the International Eco Linguistics Association, they have their own journal. And there's articles there about cultures in Africa that have eco-friendly stories. Okay. So yeah, you're 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 so right that culture plays a big role. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Uh, there is a question in the chat box from Ati, oh, okay. Ati um, Rawati. Okay, let me click on that. Hold on a minute. Yeah. From uh, Atmajaya University in Jakarta. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I... that question is, is the language used to talk to plants and animals can also be categorized as ecolinguistics? I witness people who love plants and animals often do that. Wow, that's such a good topic. I never <laughs> heard that before. Um, but yeah, it's it's really it's really true that people, or well, certainly animals, there's so much research and more and more all the time about the intelligence, about the emotions, about the family connections that animals experience because it used to be people thought oh these animals they're just dumb you know they're like the table like a spoon they can't think it's only we humans who can think but there's so much research now showing that wow even fishes even birds Mm -hmm. are doing some advanced thinking. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we should definitely talk to them. And I mean, I know people who claim that they can talk to animals and they can actually have a conversation. Now, I haven't seen any scientific proof of that, but uh, I I know people who say they can do that. But I think talking to animals and talking to plants, I think is is good stuff, because when we talk to them, we develop a relationship. And when we when we develop a relationship, we want to treat them well. We don't want them to be killed unnecessarily. So, yeah, I think that's a fantastic topic. And you, just one more little point on that: Have you heard of tree hugging? Yeah. You know, where you put your arms around a tree. And you, so yeah, maybe that's similar. So that's a fantastic topic for some research. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. One more question. Uh, sure. And then we better get back to the lecture. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what is the impact of ecolinguistic studies uh, on the language teaching? Okay. Wow. That's my number two most favorite question. <laughs> so. Uh, May Hardia had my number one favorite, but this is so important because what's the point of understanding language if we don't use it, if mm. we don't put it into practice? So just, uh, just a minor example, you know, there are many idioms in English that are not very animal friendly. Like, have you heard the idiom kill two birds, two birds with one, one stone? stone. Mm. Or there are many ways to skin a cat. Mm. Those are fairly common idioms <clears throat> in English, but they are very animal unfriendly. So we want to we want to talk to students about that. We want to teach them friendly idioms. So instead of kill two birds with one stone, we say feed two birds with one scone. S-C-O-N-E. Mm -hmm. -O -O -E. You know, a scone is a little cake. Okay. So feed two birds with one scone. 
or instead of many ways to skin a cat, we can say many ways to pet a cat. P-E-T, many ways to pet a cat. Pet, yes. And or another another thing that this is, I've done a little bit on that, but I've done more work on the use of the relative pronoun who. So most people, a lot of people would say, we can only use who with humans. But I think, and there are a lot of examples that we can use who with other animals. So the cat who lives next to me, to me, that's grammatically correct. And that's one way that we can do things in schools. And I'm going to talk more about that later. Okay, let me, okay. Um, I see there's another question, but let me get back to the PowerPoint because there's some important things I want to mention. And I'm very happy to have more questions tonight or you've all got my email. And so we can stay in touch by email. Okay, I mentioned this person named Aaron Stibbe who wrote the book Stories We Live By. So the the 2021 version is the second edition. And I I highly recommend that book. And like I said, on the International Eco-Linguistics Association website, there is um, a, a course, a free online course based on that book. So when Professor Stibbe says stories we live by, He's using a little bit different definition of story. So stories are the way that we view the world, stories in our mind. And so the stories in our mind impact what we think and what we do. So we're going to look at some of these stories. Okay, so one story is ideology. And ideology looks at people's beliefs. An example, some people believe that personal value, you know, how valuable am I as a person is determined by the amount and the cost of the possessions I own. So if I have a big house, if I have a if I have an expensive car, if I have an expensive watch, I must be a valuable person. But somebody who doesn't have a watch at all, somebody who doesn't have a car, somebody who has an old um, broken down house, they must be a person of low value. And that's a very anthrocentric view, a view that supports tearing down the earth to get many, many things for us humans. But in contrast to this view that personal value is determined by the amount and cost of possessions, other people believe that, a, that people's value is determined by what they do, such as helping others or how they interact with others. Do they interact in a kind way? Do they help people who need help, like the, the hundreds of millions of people without enough food and what their skills are? For example, do they know how to fix machines? Do they know how to speak Bahasa Indonesia? Do they know how to analyze texts to look at the ideology in terms of the environment? So if we have this view this ideology that our value is determined by what we do, how we interact with others, what our skills are, then we're going to have an ecocentric ideology. Then another kind of story is frames. So what Professor Stibbe means by frame 
is how we look at a situation. It's like a picture frame. How do we look at a, a situation? So one way to look at the climate crisis is as a horrible problem that threatens the existence of us homo sapiens and other species. And some people, some psychologists even talk about people who are becoming suicidal, who are, become, who are becoming very anxious because they're worried about the climate crisis. But another way, another frame for viewing the climate crisis is as a gigantic opportunity for us humans to change the anthropocentric views and practices and instead adopt ecocentric views and practices. So which frame are we going to use when we look at the climate crisis? Are we going to use a problem frame or an opportunity frame? Okay, then another kind of story is metaphors. So that's describing something as though it was something else. Everyone's heard the metaphor of Mother Earth, even though we all have or had human mothers. Uh. The Mother Earth metaphor can be ecocentric, encouraging environmental protection to repay the earth for providing for us, just as mothers provide for us. And just as we may feel an obligation to look after the women, not to mention the men who raised us. So that can be a very ecocentric metaphor. In contrast, an anthropocentric metaphor might be to use the word harvest, a term which normally collocates. In other words, it appears in texts with crops, mm. such as soybeans, to refer to the act of slaughtering non-human animals for meat. So you harvest the chickens, and that's meant to make the killing of the chickens seem fine. No big deal. You harvest the fish from the sea. But actually, the fish don't feel that way. Mm. So the harvest metaphor is anthropocentric because it denies the sentience. Sentience means the ability to think and feel of the animals whom we use for meat, eggs, and dairy, thereby making their exploitation less objectionable. Okay, now erasure. Erasure is when beings or ideas are viewed as not worthy of mention or consideration. So they're just erased from the story. So if you see photographs advertising some tourist resort, but there's no mention of the environmental damage required to construct the resorts or the living conditions of people who live near the resorts, because often those people were kicked out of their homes so that the resort could be built. So those people were erased and the fact that their homes were torn down was erased. Or the study that Ingrid and I are working on is about Kopilowak. So we're looking at are is the treatment of the civets, you know, the the civet cats, is it mentioned when people talk about Kopilowak? Because actually there are many times that the civets are put into cages mm. where they're force fed the coffee beans instead of their natural diet. So 
that's not talked about in advertisements for Kopi Luwak. Okay, then salience. Whoops, sorry. Salience is another type of story. In other words, how important something is. So one study that I did with a number of other people is we looked at four newspapers, the Straits Times of Singapore, the New Straits Times of Kuala Lumpur, the Guardian from the UK, and the New York Times from the US. And we looked at their coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we compared that with the same newspaper's coverage given to the ongoing disasters of lack of food, lack of clean water, lack of sanitation. And as I mentioned, millions of people die every year. And that's been going on for a long time because they don't have enough food, because they don't have access to clean water or sanitation. And these are very solvable problems. Whereas COVID-19, not sure how solvable it was. But what did we find? There was so much more coverage of COVID-19, like 99% compared to coverage of the ongoing disasters of lack of food, lack of clean water, lack of sanitation. Why? Well, we did some interviews with journalists and other people. And basically, well, are the owners of the newspapers, are the users of the newspapers, are they dying of lack of food, lack of clean water, lack of sanitation? No. So COVID was much more salient, much more important to them. Then another case that we investigated was a happy story. So this is the, what Stibby calls narrative. So narrative is a series of events in a logical sequence. And so we studied a children's film. You can watch this film on Netflix. It's called Sea Beast. And overall, it presents a very ecocentric perspective because the two main characters in the film, they begin the story attempting to hunt this, these fictional large sea creatures. That's why the film is called Sea Beast. It's definitely not a true story, okay? Let me make that clear. So they're trying to hunt them into extinction. But as the film goes on, these two people learn about the sea beast and they see that they don't hate humans. They don't want to kill humans, but they're very antagonistic toward humans because the humans have treated them very badly. And so what these two people do is get the humans, get all of the, the ships that are trying to kill the sea beasts to understand that and to be friends with the sea beasts. And then the sea beasts change their views toward us humans. And the film has a very happy ending. Mm -hmm. But in contrast, you know, there's a famous film from the 1970s a famous Hollywood movie called Jaws. Mm. And Jaws is the story of a shark yeah, yes. who kills some humans. And it's about how a group of humans chase and eventually kill the shark. So that's a very anthrocentric story. Mm. Like and an there's anaconda. many other... You know, there's so many uh, um, children's stories 
that link to the environment. We did one that we haven't published yet is called Thirst. It's a children's book written for children about 11, 12 years old. And it tells the story of a girl in Mumbai, you know, in India. She and her family, they have a big problem in Mumbai with water. Wealthier people have plenty of water. But the people who live in the slums of Mumbai, they have a big problem with water. So I'll, I won't give you the details, but it has a happy ending also. And, uh, you know, like the, 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 the girl and her family are Hindus, but like the girl's best friend is a Muslim and uh, her family and her girlfriend's family they all get along very well and they all help each other. It's a happy story in many ways. Okay, so that's some of the ideas about eco-linguistics and some, some examples of some of the research that we did. I'll just give one more example. This was a study that I helped to do that was based on Malaysian newspapers because about mm, four years ago, there was a case where two tigers walked into a Malaysian village. And so what we did was we analyzed how the newspapers covered that story. And it was very anthropocentric. It was all about how the humans reacted. Of course, humans are important. I'm a human, I care about how I react. I don't wanna get killed by a tiger. But at the same time, there was basically the tigers were erased. There was nothing about why tigers might go into a village, about how, there was nothing about how the tiger's habitats are disappearing. There's nothing about how the tigers are being killed for their body parts. So yeah, so that, that was a very interesting article to do and another example of eco-linguistic research. And then just one more that I mentioned already, but just to say a little bit more, is the use of the relative pronoun who with non-human animals. And this is something that's been studied for a long time. I helped to do a study on that 20 years ago about. And then you might have heard of this person named Jane Goodall. Mm -hmm. Jane Goodall is a very famous primatologist. In other words, she studies apes like chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. And way back in the 1960s, she was working on this issue of using who for the chimpanzees, of giving the chimpanzees names. But the people in charge of the research back then, of ch research about chimpanzees said, no, you can only give the chimpanzees numbers. You can't give them names. And you can only say the chimpanzee that or the chimpanzee which. You can't say the chimpanzee who. So there's a lot of work that's being done and still we haven't succeeded in changing this this yet you know there's a lot of work that was done about changing the pronouns and the nouns regarding males and females like it used to used to be oh um he is a firefighter he, I'm sorry he's a fireman and so that meant that if you're not a man you can't be a firefighter. But now we say firefighter to emphasize that females can do that too. Mm. Okay, so the point is that language can change. Now, I just want to end, but I'm very happy to take more questions and comments with a poem. You might have heard of this famous person in English language education, Dr. Alan Maley. Uh, maybe, yeah. And back in 2017, he co-edited a book 
titled Integrating Global Issues in the Creative English Language Classroom with reference to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And the book is free online. And there it is. There's the URL. And so in the one of the first things in the book is a poem that Dr. Maley wrote. So I'm going to read it. One thing to understand is that the words in bold are said by a member of the public. The words in the normal font are said by the teacher. And these are Alan Maley's ideas. Okay. What do you do? I'm a teacher. What do you teach? People. What do you teach them? English. Oh, you mean grammar, verbs, nouns, pronunciation, conjugation, articles and particles, negatives and interrogatives. That too. What do you mean that too? Well, I also try to teach them how to think and feel, show them inspiration, aspiration, cooperation, participation, consolation, innovation, help them think about globalization, exploitation, confrontation, incarceration, discrimination, degradation, subjugation, how inequality brings poverty, how intolerance brings violence, how need is denied by greed, how isms become prisons, how thinking and feeling can bring about healing. Well, I don't know about that. Maybe you should stick to language. Forget about anguish. You can't change the world. But if I did that, I'd be a cheater not a teacher. a teacher. The end. So I'm curious for your thoughts. Do you agree with what Alan Maley said at the end of the poem? But if I did that, I'd be a cheater, not a teacher. In other words, do teachers have an obligation mm. to teach more than language, mathematics, or science, or whatever? their subject is, are we also obligated to teach at a level appropriate to our students how to think and feel, show them inspiration, aspiration, cooperation, participation, consolation, innovation? So I'm happy to have more questions from you, but right now there is a question from me. I agree with it. Yeah. Besides teaching a language, yeah, we have to teach characters. Uh, yeah. the, way, the way to think, the way to live together, the life skills. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, language is just a tool yes. for communication, for cooperation and participation and consolation, innovation, etc. Okay, um, before we go on, let's give Ingrid a chance to talk okay. about the Kopiluwak study. Yeah, please, go Ingrid. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is any chance to uh, share screen for a little while? Okay, yeah, let me make you. Uh... Yeah, it's going to be brief, but I just want to share some examples. Okay, now you are the co-host. But you're muted. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you can see already. Okay, so um, Everyone can see my screen, right? Yes. Right. Okay, thank you. 
So this is the article that we are working with, uh, Professor Jacobs and other collaborators. And it's about uh, an ecolinguistic analysis of the role of the Tibets in Indonesia, specifically in, in Kofi Luak. Um, Professor mentioned uh, a little bit about it before, and it's uh, it comes from the high-price uh, gourmet brand that uh, it sells. And I say brand because it's kind of the, the way that they promote somehow this coffee. Uh, I know the, that, that all this leads to how uh, the attention to the chip it changes and it leads also to captivity for these animals. Uh, it, uh, this captivity, let's say, leads to these farming models, which is something very similar that we can see with chicken or with cows in larger scale though. And this in general is going to be part of an investigation based on newspapers from Indonesia mostly from Compass and Jakarta Post, and it's based on Aaron's TV uh, stories we live by uh, that Professor Jacob just explained. I'm going to show you these uh, examples of some of the things that we have been seeing through the news. Uh, one of the examples is, uh, well, you can see the Indonesian and the English version. Hopefully that's uh, good for you all. Uh, but we can see that even in the title, it starts by saying most expensive or termahal, and not even just any uh, expensive, but in the world. And then uh, we can see that it is repeated during the text by saying most expensive again. And then to put more emphasis, they even put the price of it. And we can see that it's not a low price that is actually quite high for this standard of consumption that the average of people may acquire. So what we can uh, see through this is that the focus first is put in how expensive or gourmet the coffee is. The animal in the news is only mentioned in relation to the coffee. Uh, in most of the cases, we can see that the luak is mentioned only to refer to the process of how the coffee is made, but besides that, is erased. Then we can see in this other version, this is from Compass, uh, how the story about the luak have changed through time. Uh, this would be the framing that Professor Jacobs was talking about before, and we can see that before it was considered a pest. But now, because of, of this uh, coffee um, raising uh, popularity, now the animal is actually considered as pets at home. So we can see how the story that is being told to us through time has changed even the perception that people had about the animal itself. Then we have another example here, and this is about uh, the production. Uh, so there is this wild source production, and there is this, yeah, like uh, they said, it is even better taste if we take digested chivets uh, in wild situation. Like if they're free and they eat the beans that they like and like they, they actually pick the right ones, the coffee even tastes better. But what happens is that the production is not too much. So it's not being profitable probably for the people that work with the coffee and therefore it ends up in uh, cages for the animal. So this is another perspective, like uh, is this production enough for the people? How the people that are producing this coffee actually live and how much do they need to produce to actually create a good income for themselves? And finally, 
we have this example in which the they refer to the luak as a coffee rat or a tree dog. Uh, terms are not really, like if we talk, uh, think about evaluation, they're not really good ones <laughs> if we think in general terms. Like the perspective that we have about rats is probably not the best, which is also wrong according to this whole eco-linguistic theory. But that's the way the journalists refer to to the animal. And then even more, they said that again, that it was considered a creepy pest in the past. Then they referred to the animal as their utility. So we are thinking about the animal as a tool or as a machine or as an actually human being. I mean, uh, as a being, not human, I'm sorry. And then they uh, put this metaphor like the consideration before of the fecal matter was a very inconvenience for the villager, as is dog crap to the jogger in the New York City. Finally, we can see that the journalists describe the eyes creepily open to describe how the animal sleep because they do not fully close their eyes, but it is a natural act from the animal, but it's actually creepy for the journalist. So this kind of things that we can find all through the media are very important, not only to the consideration of the animal, but also uh, of the production of it, of the everything that is surrounding this, this coffee. So yeah, that's just uh, some of the examples that I wanted to share. And we are still working on it, and hopefully we can finish soon with success. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Ingrid, can you can you tell me what are uh, or what is the research question? Um, it's mostly about the analysis of uh the perception of the animal through media. In this case, in newspapers. Uh, yeah, okay. how are the animals represented uh, in, in these media. two in newspapers? The media. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, do we have a Thank question you. in the chat box? Okay. Yeah. Let's go. Go on, on from. Uh, you want to say something, Prof. Jacob? Um. No, I'm happy to have a look at the. Well, okay, let me ask another question, because I actually enjoy asking questions more than answering them. So I already asked the question about, do you agree with what Alan Maley says in the, in the poem? Of course, Prof. Safnil already answered, but I'd like to hear some other views as well, but also do you have any ideas for a study related to ecolinguistics? Do any of you have any anything in mind mm. from what you heard tonight? Yeah, please. Is there any uh, idea uh, for uh, a research, piece of research on ecolinguistic? Silakan. Ada ide tentang penelitian. Uh, I want to uh, share about uh, my idea. Please. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, some, Andriadi, uh, yeah. Andriadi. Yeah, Andriadi. Yeah, please. Uh, Prof. Jacobs. Uh, some months ago, I met, met some women they in an organization where they are writers. And they discuss about uh, how women um uh, contribute to safe environment and their writers they try to uh, write uh, literary works like poems or um uh, uh, uh short stories or novels uh, where they uh, try to uh, show their thoughts how they um how they um how they uh, save the 
the environments, how they save the environment through the literary works. Uh, I want to ask you questions. Are the uh, movements or literary works they produce can be the subject materials for uh, the ecolinguistic? I think that's a fantastic idea times three. It's a super fantastic idea. And there's more and more of this kind of literature. There's like, for example, I'm quite a bad poet, but I've actually published a couple poems. One of them was in a poetry journal that is especially for what they call eco-poetry. Mm. And I subscribe to a newsletter. It's all, it's called eco-literature newsletter. So it's all about like exactly what Adudiadi said about poems and stories and novels, etc. All uh, that have ideas that are pro-environment, that are ecocentric, not anthrocentric. So I think studying these is a wonderful idea. Because one thing is, studying them is one way to popularize them, to let more people know about them, and to encourage more people to write that way. And of course, let me make it super clear that eco-linguistics isn't just about in English. It can be in any language. Like the example I mentioned before about the professor in Kuala Lumpur who studies Tamil. Okay, more questions? Well, I see in the chat somebody yes, had yes. another idea. Yeah. Uh, I think it's our friend from Atmajaya yeah. who talked about the book, Jungle Book. The jungle Book, yeah. Which is a very famous book. I think it was made into a movie too. Um, yeah, it's it's that's a great example of a positive relationship between humans and other animals. So yeah, we want to popularize these positive examples. Remember, I mentioned before about positive discourse analysis. So we're not just criticizing what exists, even though we do that, and that's what uh, Ibu Ingrid and I and our colleagues are doing with the Kopi Luwak study, but we're also praising. And even in, we did find some good examples, some ecocentric texts talking about Kopi Luwak. So, yeah. Another question from Ibu Risna Abdul in the chat box. Okay, let me, oh, I see it, right, okay. Ecolinguistics may be one of the newest branches of linguistics. However, it has an important role in the educational field. Through ecolinguistics, students can possess both linguistics and ecological knowledge at the same time. Moreover, the case of environmental issues is getting higher day by day. As an English teacher, what can we do to improve the students' linguistics and ecological knowledge? Well, actually, that reminds me just the other day, uh, Ibu Ingrid told me about another study that she wants to do about English textbooks and how they cover the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, Ibu Ingrid, would you like to say a little bit? I know you haven't really gotten started yet, but it's an idea that you want to work on. Uh, I, I already started. Oh, great. <laughs> a bit. Okay. Yes. Uh, but yes, um, but I'm focusing, yes, on material. So that will be textbooks which is one of the main tools for the teachers. So uh, once we have a good base, which is uh, my idea, once we have a good base to teach, to of guidance to teach, then the rest of it should be fluid. So if your material is actually eco-linguistic applied, let's say, um, it would be way more easier to uh, create activities or maybe you don't need to adapt too much um, or what is happening right now is that 
people is independently creating this uh, eco-friendly material because the textbooks provide, let's say, by the government, they do not include this. So why don't we make it official? That is uh, the idea that I have right now. So yes, that is what I can say so far. Thank you. Okay, more, more questions? Prof. Jacobs, uh, one of my friends uh, did a study on uh, rubber uh, farmers in West Sumatra. He mm -hmm. looked at uh, the terms the farmers use uh, in doing their business, uh, everyday uh, business. And he was comparing the successful farmers and the unsuccessful farmers in the rubber farmers. Mm -hmm. Uh he was looking the terms, the language uh, they use, yeah, um, in in the comparison. So this is one uh, a kind of uh, eco linguistic study, right? Uh, it could be. It could be because one thing that I I mentioned in the PowerPoint, I mentioned this term intersectionality. Mm. So we're not just we don't just care about the other animals or about the plants, but we also care about the people. Mm -hmm. And there's this term called eco-justice. So, because uh, you know that when we talk about global warming and all the flooding and the other kinds of destruction that are caused by the climate crisis, it's the poorer people who suffer the most. So we want to get their points of view and not just the experts, not just the, the owners of the rubber factories or the owners of the people, of the companies that make tires uh, for cars, but we wanna value the rubber farmers too. So I think that's, that's really good. And we wanna see how, how things have changed over the years, and we want to see how they feel, how the farmers feel that they can coexist with the environment. Because let's say, for example, if there's a drought, it's going mm -hmm. to be very hard for them. So how can rubber farming coexist with a green environment? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Is there any other questions? Uh, well, Ingrid, uh, since uh, these students are going to uh, do research for their dissertation or for thesis, do you have any suggestion for them, uh, particular topics uh, to do, which is good enough for a thesis or for a dissertation? Um, I think because ecolinguistic is kind of multidisciplinary thing mm. I would suggest something that you like and find a way that you can link a linguistic with that because it can be applied almost every area if not every area of your life so you have the plus that is something that you like so you're be you're going to be more motivated most probably to write your thesis or your article so for me it's animals and I want to write about it, for example. And maybe you also, you all have something that is uh, inspiring for you all. That is just my suggestion. Okay. And uh, just to add what Ibu Ingrid said, it's good to start by reading, mm. reading a lot of articles and books. And that way you can see what other people have done and you can build on that. So because there's very little or no research done in Indonesia and with Bahasa Indonesia. And I know that Indonesia is rich in languages, so many different languages. So there's so many possibilities to take what other people have done and do it with reference to uh, Indonesian situations, Indonesian languages, Indonesian cultures. 
So step one is read a lot. Read a lot, okay. Uh, if, for example, there's a um, the list of references hmm. in the at the back of the PowerPoint. They have one special issue of a journal. All the articles are about ecolinguistics. So you might get some ideas from there. Uh, Prof. Jacob, I, I still remember that once you publish a book uh, about environments for English uh, English classes. That's right, with um, some lectures in Surabaya. Yeah. Is yeah. it a, a, a result of uh, ecolinguistic study? Well, because to be honest with you, at the when we did that book, which was probably 20 years ago, mm. I never even heard of ecolinguistics. <laughs> so, it, it, but it's definitely now that I look back on it, it's definitely related to that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's definitely related to that. There was one question in the chat about. Yep. Is Professor Halliday the founder of ecolinguistics? Well, uh, Professor Halliday did a lot of fantastic things, but it doesn't really matter to me. The key is what are we doing and is it helping to make the world a better place? And whether you call it ecolinguistics or positive discourse analysis or critical discourse analysis or whatever you, you say the definition of ecolinguistics is, I don't care. It's what you do and the impact that you can have. Okay, more questions? Okay, Prof. Prof. Jacobs, uh, you mentioned at the beginning of uh, this lecture that equally linguistic is uh, similar to critical discourse analysis. While in critical uh, critical discourse analysis, we uh, often focus on the language in the media. Uh, is it also the case in uh, for ecolinguistic? Well, I think that you're right that. There's a lot about the media. The study I mentioned about tigers in Malaysia, the study I mentioned about COVID in the newspapers, that's in the media. But as one of your students mentioned, there's so much other types of literature nowadays about you know the poems, the short stories, the books. Actually, I did another study with one of my colleagues at James Cook University about advertisements for burgers. Because, you know, nowadays there's burgers made from dead cows and there's burgers made from plants. And so our study was a contrast between the two kinds of advertisements. So some of it was print advertisement, but also we had videos. So, um, we don't need to limit ourselves to just the media. There's so many things we can look at. And, or like, uh, yeah, what the rubber farmers are talking about or the, the traditional stories going back uh, hundreds and thousands of years. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh is there any more questions from the students? I also invited uh, from West Sumatra, yeah, from Padang. Great. Yeah, yeah, PhD students also from West Sumatra. Yeah, and we're very happy to do a similar workshop at other universities if they are, if they are interested. Yeah. Okay, please, if you have any question. In the chat box, Professor Neil, there is a question. Question, yeah. If we study about the form of eco-lexicon in conservation, in conservation, conservation text in mass media, is it 
part of the eco-linguistic research topic? Um, eco-lexical. Hold on, let me, I'm scrolling here through the chat. Well, yeah, it's a really, that's a really interesting question because nowadays there are so many new words that start with echo. Mm. You know, there's eco psychology. There's eco, like as the questioner says, there's eco pedagogy, there's eco literacy, there's eco sociology. So <laughs> all these things are, and as Ingrid said, it's a multidisciplinary field. So it can link with so many different areas. So it's really fun to do echo linguistics because you can link with anything. Like a student at um, University of Malaya, she's a graduate student. Uh, she's a secondary school science teacher. So she, I helped her not very much, but a little bit with a study on sustainable diets. So what kind of, how the food we eat affects the environment. So yeah, everybody likes to eat. So there's a, a, a very happy topic. We can talk, we can talk about food. We can eat lots of nice food. Okay, more question. Uh, eco, uh, eco pedagogy. So eco is like a very productive uh, prefix. <laughs> exactly. It's a highly productive prefix. You're absolutely right. Okay. Yeah, is there any other questions? We you need uh, to have a photo taken, uh, please uh, switch on your camera. Silakan dihidupkan kameranya. Ya, silakan diambil fotonya. Ya, Pak Mardi boleh siapa saja. Safrizal atau Ibu May. Rob. Okay. Ya, ada dua ini ya, dua uh, halaman. Okay, from the first page, yeah. Yeah. So, yang pertama, okay, one, two, three. Wait a moment, one, two, three, for the first page. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bu, Ingrid, uh, for the second you... page. Okay, not yet. Okay, for the second page. Okay, open all. One, two, three. Again. Okay. Well, Ingrid, can you give us your email address? Yeah, so maybe the students um, yes. may contact you. Um, should I put it in the chat or? Okay, chat, yes. Yes, put it in the chat. Chat box. Okay. <clears throat> I think okay. Gavilantatin gmail dot com. Okay, thank you very much, Ingrid, and Prof. Uh, Jacobs. Thank you very much. Yeah, dear students. Yeah, I met Prof. Jacob in nineteen ninety five. <laughs> oh, okay, is that when it was? I couldn't remember when. Yeah, 1995. A long time ago, yeah. Yeah, when I attended a short uh, course in RELC, uh, Regional English Language Center in Singapore. Yeah, and I remember Prof. Safnil gave me a beautiful red oh. batik shirt. <laughs> yeah. And I wore it so much, finally, it just wore out, and I had to <laughs> send it to be uh, recycled, the oh, material. But 
Yes, I that was I appreciate that a lot. A friend of us will go to NIE soon. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh wow. Prof. Prof. Uh, Prof. Willie Renandia told me. Okay. Yeah, Prof. Yeah. Willie is a good friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. I, in fact, I did a workshop in his class mm -hmm. just two weeks ago. Is there any chance uh, for you to meet uh, Prof. Willie anytime? Prof. Willie, yeah, sure. Okay, I I okay. see him a lot. He oh, th he. You. I'm friends with, you know, his wife. His wife is friends with my wife. We mm. we we do a lot of things together. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Jacobs, Bu Ingrid, and all the students. Uh, Ibu Ati yeah, from Atmajaya. Have you graduate, graduated, mm. Bu Ati? Still in the process. Oh, still in the process. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I examine Aldi. Yeah, Aldi. Oh, okay. Yeah, in Atmajaya. Okay. Okay, thank you very much Yeah, uh, for coming to this uh, very uh, mm. interesting and fruitful uh, lecture from Prof. Uh, Jacobs and Bu Ingrid. We hope that we can do some studies on this topic, yeah, uh, for your dissertation or for your thesis. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.